Welcome, everyone. We are so very happy to have you here. Now, when you pay a lot of money for something that's supposed to have real and lasting value, and you don't get what you paid for, you understandably want your money back. Now, if I were the parent of a kid who was at the Ivy League Columbia University, I'd want my money and my kid back. That's what I'd want. It, it cost over $90,000 a year for the privilege of being a student at Columbia University in New York City. And I would think that most parents send a child there with the hopes that he or she will get a world-class education that will lead to a seven-figure job and a solid future. But watching the disgraceful behavior of students, the faculty, and the president of Columbia this week, I would insist that my child pack his or her bags, get on the first flight, and get home. I'd not only be demanding a full refund, I'd initiate a class action lawsuit with other parents for being defrauded into believing that Columbia was educating students to be intelligent and responsible adults. Instead, Columbia has turned the asylum over to the inmates, and it's become a place of genuine danger for Jewish students who are being bullied, harassed, and threatened with their very lives by students whose parents ought to be ashamed of the ignorant and arrogant little snots that they raised. The atmosphere has gotten so bad that Columbia suspended in-person classes for the rest of the year, and now they're offering courses virtually. The students who have disrupted the campus created total meltdown of the social order and have promoted Jew-hating, anti-Semitic genocide of the state of Israel and the Jewish people ought to be expelled immediately, banned from ever setting foot on the campus again, and ordered to pay for the damages to the other students whose education is being stolen by these selfish little brats. I mean, Let's face it, most of the protesters are from upper-income families. One, by the way, is the daughter of the radical nut job and America-hating congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Another one is from Georgia, whose parents live in a $3 million home. Their little darling is hardly capable of having a clue about oppression, discrimination, or deprivation. But yet she calls for death to America while wearing a covering over her privileged white face and screaming support for Hamas. I mean, does she have a clue that by supporting Hamas, she's calling for the violent rape of innocent women in front of their families? Or for the beheading of babies in their cribs? For the butchering of women and children in their own homes? I mean, a parent paying just south of $100,000 for their child's education ought to get more than having their child turned into a genocidal monster who screams for the annihilation of the Jewish people. But that's exactly what these people are demanding when they scream from the river to the sea. So far, a small number of these ungrateful little hellions have taken a quick bus ride to a police precinct, but then they get turned loose, while the Jewish students are urged to shelter in place or even told to leave the campus completely for their own safety. Many of the overpaid professors have joined in the anarchy, and the only professor at Columbia who has been banned from the campus is a Jewish professor. Folks, this looks more like something from 1933 Nazi Germany than modern America. It may be that the spoiled, overindulged offspring of elites who made their way to what's now best described as a poison ivy campus, they permanently destroyed the hundreds of years of prestige that these once prestigious universities have held. Now, billionaire donors like Bob Kraft, the owner of the New, York, uh, New England Patriots, they have announced their wallets will be closed, just as closed as are the minds of the young students who ignorantly believe that America is rotten Life in Gaza is peachy keen. And that's a start for the donors to start doing that. But I think it's time for parents who truly love their children to refuse to send them to a sausage grinder of stupidity 
so as to have them mentally mutilated by idiots who teach them that it is okay to murder civilians ruthlessly and then celebrate it gleefully. If you want to turn your child into a dim-witted psychopath, I'd say do it at home. Save your money. <laughs> or you could just raise your children to respect God, their freedom, their wonderful country, and other people, and save more than your money. You might just save your kids. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson last weekend muscled through the passage of a major, major bipartisan funding package, distributing $60 billion in aid funding to Ukraine, a sticking point for many Republicans. So was it a victory for the GOP or the start of another mutiny? My next guest knows a thing or two about leading the Republican conference and the House of Representatives. He's done it before. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to visit with the 55th Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Mr. Speaker, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, there's a lot going on in Washington. Uh, do you miss being in the, the seat and orchestrating a lot of this stuff? Or are you kind of glad to maybe step back and watch it from, uh, from a distance? Well, Governor, it's always an honor to be back on your show. You know, I loved every minute of it. You know, as a public servant, it, it is exciting. Every minute you're a part of it. It's also still nice to be on the outside and uh, still be a part of it in some ways. And, uh, but what I look at happening right now, though, it just seems chaotic, especially around the world. And uh, as you being a, a student of history, it concerns me um, what I'm seeing around the world, this anti-Semitism, this... Um, this e axis of evil bounding together with Russia, China, and North Korea, and Iran. And uh, I just think this nation needs to stay strong, and that's why this election is so important. Just this week, a former speaker, Democrat Nancy Pelosi, actually had the audacity to call for the resignation of Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Mr. Speaker, I don't ever recall any former congressman or former speaker, current congressman, U.S. official, openly calling for another nation uh, to oust its leader. This is unprecedented. Uh, speak to it's, that it's a, and, and what's going on in our country when we have this going on. This is appalling. When we're looking around the country, especially this week, you saw the uprising in these college campuses. But you'd have to really stem, and this is where history is important with the 1930s, the, the growing of anti-Semitism. Now we're seeing it across America, but you wanna understand why. Now, now we've got a former speaker, you've got uh, Chuck Schumer did this exact same thing. But remember, Nancy Pelosi would not rebuke Congresswoman Omar when she equated United States and Israel to the terrorist organization of Hamas and the Taliban. And she wouldn't rebuke them. Remember, she allowed um, Omar to be on Foreign Affairs Committee with her anti-Semitic views. It wasn't until I became speaker that we removed her. And even when I was speaker, you had Congresswoman Tlaib wanting to hold inside the U.S. Capitol an anti-Semitism, anti-Israel meeting that I took the uh, room away. But you had Bernie Sanders hold it in his office. So if you wonder what's happening on college campuses, a lot of it seems to be stemming because the Democrats allowing it in our, in our halls of Congress to go forward, and this is why you've got to stop it. Could you imagine having paid um, for your child to go to Columbia, and now all the classes are being shut down. But when you look out at the protest and you see all those tents, same color and others, you wonder who's paying for these protests? Who's paying to disrupt our university system and have the fear for Jewish students and those who are professors who have Jewish faith to be fearful to even go to campus? Several people noted that uh, the tents that were set up in the courtyard in Columbia were all uniformly the same exact tent. It, it wasn't as if these kids went out to academy sports and, and, and bought tents. Somebody supplied them. Somebody uh, gave them a, sort of a, a matrix of how to do this. Do we have any idea who's funding some of this irrational nonsense happening on the Ivy League campuses? 
I don't have a direct of who it is. You, get, you have your suspicions always uh, who funds these type of organizations before. But, it, but it's really telling if they're all the same, all professional-looking tents and others, that this is a professional operation trying to disrupt our nation. You, you've got a terrorist organization six months ago that taking kidnapping ch uh, children and elderly people, raping young women, killing and murdering to a larger extent than what happened on 9-11. And where is the outcry for that? These hostages are still being held, babies. And now we're having protests on college campuses that somehow you watched even in New York where people would hold not just the flag but the symbolism for a terrorist organization of Hamas. This is appalling that you have Democrats on the other side of the aisle not standing up against it, that their own leadership is calling out for some type of change in leadership in Israel and not denouncing the terrorist organization of Hamas or crying out for those hostages to come home. Some are actually American hostages as well. Mr. Speaker, I want us to continue our conversation. When we come back after the break, we'll discuss some of the goings on in the House this past week, particularly the vote on foreign aid, uh, some of the concerns about the border, and more. We'll be back with Kevin McCarthy right after this. Still to come, author Bonnie Jill Laughlin celebrates some of the biggest female sports stars in history. And Anthony Evans brings an incredible gospel performance. All that and more tonight on Huckabee. Welcome back. We're uh, visiting with former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the most, I guess, chaotic scenes that has played out in Congress happened last week. Uh, the new Speaker, Mike Johnson, seemed to have some real problems getting the package for Ukraine through. It also included assistance for Israel and Taiwan. But there really wasn't anything in there about border security. Um, I'm not asking you to judge unfairly or harshly, but was it a mistake, not just for the Speaker, but for the Republicans to go through that bill, but not insist on something for border security, which I think most Americans believe we have to have? Well, Governor, it's the number one issue. I, I, I was just speaking across the country, and <clears throat> I was in Massachusetts where there's no Republicans in Congress from there, and their governor has declared a state of emergency based upon the southern border. Now, when I was speaker, the plan was always, if you were the majority, you control what comes to the floor. You determine what bill comes up. Why wouldn't you put a border security bill? Look, I support Ukraine, but what I had always told President Biden, I'm only gonna do Ukraine funding with the border funding as well, that we were gonna shut down that border because now you've got terrorists um, on the watch list coming across that border. In one month, we caught more people on the terrorist watch list in February than we did the entire last administration. We have now the FBI telling us there's fear that there could be cells or threats with inside America. And here you are, the majority. When Israel was attacked on October 7, I don't think Republicans should have waited six months to fund Israel. You sent a wrong message to Iran and all the other countries. What you should have done is fund Israel sit back and go directly to the White House. Don't ask the Senate Republicans to negotiate this because they're in the minorities. Don't sit down with Schumer and Hakeem. Go directly to the president. I did this when we did the debt ceiling. We cut $2 trillion, the largest cut in American history. We got welfare reform, NEPA reform. We actually pulled money back from those IRS, those auditors. You never would have got that with the other Democratic leaders. But if you have the strength of the majority, you should utilize it and determine what comes to the floor. I think America would have celebrated having border security, securing that border, what we're watching every day happen, come across. You had 22,000 um, illegals from China coming across the border so far this year. Those are just people we've caught. From 160 different countries, people are coming because they know that it is wide open. And you should use that leverage 
of controlling the floor and being in the majority to secure the border and also protect where we are around the world that we are safer for the future. There was basically uh, a coup d'etat that was staged against you when you were the speaker not that very long ago, led by uh, Florida Congressman Matt Gates. He had a total of eight Republicans, eight out of uh, over 218 members of Congress. Uh, they were able to create a situation where you were ousted as speaker, and there were weeks that went by with total chaos in the House while the country was burning. I know many of us were very concerned that it's one thing to say we want fresh leadership. You know, people have a right to think that, whether they need it or not. But you ought to be able to count to 50 plus one in terms of the percentages to realize that if you don't have the numbers, you don't get there. Reflect back on, on that whole situation. It must have been frustrating to see uh, a rebellion by so small a number, but that led to such a chaotic result. Yeah, it, it was frustrating because when you think about this one person, Matt Gates, it wasn't stemmed from anything we were voting on because we were passing the Parents' Bill of Rights. We had a border security bill passed. We were doing uh, appropriation bills individually. We had an energy bill through. It's more based upon an ethics complaint that happened to him prior to me being speaker. He wanted me to do something illegal to stop it, and I wouldn't do that. And if I had to lose my job over it, so be it. But to have eight members partner with every single Democrat to determine who could be speaker, to bring chaos, and what have we been able to pass since that move forward? No new real policy. But you had 94% of the Republicans say this is who they want to be speaker, but you had these crazy eight with Matt Gates and Bob Good partnering and Nancy Mace with every single Democrat. That's with Hakeem Jeffries. That's with Omar. That's with Tlaib. You know, Swalwell and Schiff were really upset with me because I removed them from the Intel Committee. But those are the people that Gates, Nancy Mace, and Bob Good worked with. Omar, Tlaib. And that's a frustration that most Republicans across the nation felt and inside Congress. And then we went for three weeks where they said, then Jim Jordan wasn't good enough, Tom Emmer. Um, it really held us back to utilize this majority. And now, based upon what those eight have done, it held up our ability to get border security, even though we passed HR2. Um, and that, that frustrates me, really, because what we said we would do for the American people allowing eight to work with all the Democrats, with, working with Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell and Elhan Omar. Um, what Matt Gates and Nancy Mays and Bob Good did really hurt our majority and hurt our nation from getting border security. And, and I want to speak to the politics of it because, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I recall you raised money and helped get elected some of these very people who then turned on you. And, and I found that just astonishing. Well, I look back, I actually helped Matt Gates in his primary to come to Congress. I, I raised more than $6 million so Nancy Mace, even in her primary to become, and Bob Good more than $2 million to win the general election. But hey, look, I, I don't do that so someone would be helping me. I did that to try to help the nation. So I kind of look back at myself, maybe that was a bad judgment. If Had I known ahead of time they were going to work with Democrats to try to control who could become speaker in the House, I probably would have thought differently. But I, I'm proud of what we've been able to do. When I came into minority leader and Nancy Pelosi became speaker, we, we grew five seats in California, five in New York. We elected the most Republican women, the most minority Republicans in the history of Congress. And we, we won when Republicans lost the White House and two terms in the Senate. We won both times. And I believe this election cycle, it's easier to win more seats in the House than it has been for the next two. But unfortunately, the fundraising now is much lower than it was before. And then now the chaos as what that created has hurt it at the same time, too. I just think they're probably not being loyal to their constituents of what they said they would do, Bob Good, Nancy Mace, and Matt Gates by working with all the Democrats. Mr. Speaker, it's been a pleasure to visit with you. Thanks for coming on the program, and uh, we look forward to visiting again. I wish you nothing but the best. It's always been uh, a joy to call you friend, and uh, great to have you here. Thank you, Governor, and God bless.
Many thanks to Kevin McCarthy for joining us. And if you want to keep up with the former Speaker of the House, just go to Huckabee.tv. You'll find all the links. All right. Keith Bilbrey, why don't you tell us who is on deck for the rest of the show? Well, coming up next, author Bonnie Jill Laughlin highlights some of the biggest firsts in women's sports. And later, the very funny Nick Arnett performs right here on Huckabee. Well, despite so much evil in the world, there's always hope. Samaritan's Purse continues to deliver the hope of Jesus Christ all over the world. They do that by providing physical and spiritual help to those who need it the most. In times of war, natural disaster, or whatever storm may come, Samaritan's Purse responds because of the prayers and generous giving from people just like you. If you want to be a part, of the great work that Samaritan's Purse is doing, I hope you'll call them today. Or you can visit their website, real simply, scan the QR code on your screen. Thanks and God bless. Well, Bonnie Jill Laughlin is a trailblazing sports broadcaster, TV personality, author, and philanthropist. She was the first and the only female NBA scout. She hosts the Weekly Pass podcast, She's the founder of Hounds and Heroes and Horses. It's a nonprofit that pairs rescue dogs and horses with wounded warriors and veterans. Her new book is a wonderful book. It's called In a League of Her Own, celebrating female first in sports. Please give a warm welcome to Bonnie Jill Laughlin. Bonnie Jill, I'm so excited to have you. I've, I've read the book. I just was intrigued. I, I had no idea about some of the stories. But you yourself are a trailblazer for women, just as all of the subjects in this book are. Uh, the glass ceiling, you busted it several times. Uh, you must have some glass shards in your head from having <laughs> hit it so many times. Yeah, it was, you know, tough, you know, because being the only female, you're not knowing what to expect. I was trying to be one of the boys. So I would, Governor, throw up my hair in a ball cap so they wouldn't know that I was a girl. I think they knew the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure they did. And I just wanted to be accepted, so I would like made sure that you know that they didn't um, judge me differently because I was a female. So I just always try to like mesh with the boys. And finally, one of the assistant coaches says, "Stop walking like that. Stop putting your hair up. You know sports. You know how to break down the triangle offense. You know this. Just you know, be you." And finally, I was able to kind of embrace that. But it must have been kind of at times awkward that all these guys in the NBA, you're the only female scout in the league ever. Yes, sir. It was tough because I was the only female. I did have to prove myself, and I was always under a microscope, so I was always working harder. It was like Michael Jordan, who's a friend of mine, and Kobe Bryant told me, you have to make sure that you prove yourself, so yeah. get there earlier. Be the last one to leave. You know, wor your work ethic is going to be so important, and I really um, took that to heart and really made sure that I uh, kind of walked that journey throughout uh, my life and obviously my career. Did you scout some pretty familiar names in the NBA? I did. Uh, Jordan Farmar was one of my guys. And uh, it was funny because Phil wasn't sure if he wanted a guy, like, a kid like him. He wasn't a really tall guard. And they weren't sure about his you know, basketball IQ. But I kind of nudged Phil and said, yeah, I think he's going to be great. He ended up getting two championship rings. So it worked out. It, it's impossible to talk female sports without mentioning Caitlin Clark, a phenom. Absolutely. I loved watching her play. I'm so excited. What she's doing for women's basketball and frankly for sports is nothing short of incredible. Oh, she's been amazing. This is the first time, Governor, that actually people are watching the women's college basketball yeah. tournament rather than the men's. Everyone was- Me like, too. Right. I did not watch the final <laughs> four. I watched Caitlin Clark play. Yes. I did. And she's amazing. And what she's done for women in sports and, you know, the impact that she's made like globally. I mean, she's yeah. a global star. She's the biggest name right now. And she's so humble um, and she's, she just, perfect to me because she's all around, uh, you know, she really walks the walk, talks the talk. You know, Bonnie Jean, the thing that amazes me about her, she's a phenomenal shooter. I mean, she can shoot a three-pointer from anywhere in the right. court. 
but she's also a very unselfish player. The part mm -hmm. of her that didn't get as much attention, but she's always shoveling the ball to everybody else on the team because she thinks they've got a good shot. She's not a ball hog. No. Uh, she could be, and, and she'd probably still lead them to win the game, but she's one of the most unselfish, great players I've ever watched. Yeah, people never talk about her assists because she's dishing the ball out all the time. Yeah. People just talk about her deep threes, and but she actually is really a team player. You can see how her, her all of her players, they rally you know, around her because they love her, and that just shows a lot, you know, how she is in the locker room, and that translates onto the court. When I think about it, it's not just that you were an NBA scout. You've done rodeo. Yes. You, you have been in professional rodeo. You have been uh, on the cheerleading squads for three different NFL teams. You have Super Bowl rings, NBA. I mean, you know, most <laughs> guys would love to have just been able to hang out where you have been. <laughs> I mean, what a career. Yeah, it's been something I've always just been kind of conquer the world type of mentality and wanted to do so many, so many things, you know, God willing, I've been able to. And it's just been you know, a dream for me to work in sports. And now I'm living that dream. There were some great stories in the book in a league of her own. And the one that I loved the most, Mary Lou Retton. Yes. I, I want to meet her. I want to have her on the you show. Get her on the show. <laughs> Please do help me do it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm telling you, I still remember in 1984, I say that kid, because she was 16 years old. She made this country proud of America. She made us proud of her. I just remember that joyful smile. She went out there with reckless abandon and nailed it and beat everybody in the world. It was one of the most exciting moments in Olympic history. Oh, yeah, she was America's sweetheart. I remember she was on my Wheaties box. My dad tried to eat the Wheaties. And I go, you can't eat that. You can't eat those Wheaties. You can't eat those Wheaties. So Mary Lou on it. You know, so she's just, to be able to talk to some of these ladies that I look up to was yeah. just phenomenal. I, you know... You know, when you write a book, you try to get the, you know, you hope that people will embrace it and you hope that people will want to be a part of it. And then you start to talk to so many of these ladies and Danica Patrick and having them, you know, really yeah. be, you know, candid and authentic and genuine. And it meant a lot to, you know, to see these ladies really. The, the chapter on Jane Kennedy, out. I'd forgotten oh, yeah. what a trailblazer she was. I mean, mm -hmm. there was nobody in sports broadcasting who was a female right. when she broke into it. And people forget and, about her, Governor. They always think about some of the other ladies. Yeah. It was her. But, you know, if it hadn't been for her, these others wouldn't have had the shot. Right. So, you know, are there two or three that, as, as you think back on writing the book, that just really blessed you as not just a writer, but as a woman, to, to see that these people overcame extraordinary challenges to be the best in their field? Yes, absolutely. You mentioned two of them already, Mary Lou. And especially she did the interview with me, Governor, while she was sick. Oh. And she was going through so much adversity during that time. And she was still said to me, I'm so surprised you picked me to be in your book. She goes, I don't think some of your readers are even going to know who I am. Are you kidding? And I'm like, what? <laughs> You're merely rotten. And that was so important. I think the younger generation needed to be aware of the women that paved the way. You know, yes. that there was no social media, right? You know, there wasn't these platforms now that these women have. And these, they call them like hidden gems. Like Manon Rayom was the first female to play mm -hmm. an NHL hockey game. A lot of women don't know who she is. So, and we had a similar story when she was a goaltender, she would throw her hair up. Because she didn't want yeah. people, her dad to say, go out there. They're going to treat you differently if you're a girl. So put your hair up. And then when you're a goalie, they're not going to think you're a boy. And so me and her, you know, kind of talked about that. And then Danica Patrick, she told me, she's like, I never realized that I was this role model until yeah. I had little girls saying, I want to be a race car driver. And she started crying during the interview. Wow. And she said, I can't believe that now I look back. She goes, maybe I should have had different decisions or maybe I should have done things differently knowing that I was a role model. Because at that time, I was just you know, in my sport. And she goes, now I realize the impact that I made. Mm. Before I let you go, you've got to tell us about the charity that you do, uh, Hounds, Horses, and Heroes, or is it Hounds? Hounds, Heroes, Heroes and Horses, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I knew there were all three in there. I wasn't sure the order. Get it right. So what do you do with that wonderful gift to veterans and our wounded warriors. Yeah, I did 19 USO tours overseas, um, HO Iraq and Afghanistan, and it was so important for me to give back to our men and women in uniform after they came back. And yeah. speaking with the VA and lobbying for veterans on Capitol Hill, I said, we need to do more. And so I rescue these dogs, and then we pair them up with wounded warriors suffering from PTS, TBI, amputees as service and therapy dogs. And then on my ranch in Fort Worth, it's called Battle Buddy Ranch, and we have veterans and uh, first responders come out to the ranch, and they ride our different horses. And um, it's just a great way to be able to, to give back. Also, um, children of fallen soldiers as well come out. 
Well, I hope people will get the book in a league of her own, also to find out about her charity. And if you want to learn more about hounds and heroes and horses and all that Bonnie Jill Laughlin is up to in her projects, if you'll go to Huckabee.tv, we have the connections to the book and to the charity and all the things. By the way, speaking of hounds, heroes, and horses, I am going to hound our hero, Keith Bilbrey, to stop horsing around and go ahead and preview what's coming up on the show. Keith, it's all yours. Uh, what an introduction. Well, after the break, prepare to laugh with hilarious comedian Nick Arnett. And be sure to stick around for the great gospel singing of Anthony Evans on Huckabee. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. You know who rocks the house every single week at this show. I'll tell you who it is. It's Trey Corley in the Music City Connection. Join me in giving them a big hand of appreciation. Nick Arnett is a comedian, motivational speaker, and he's the author of such books as Me, We, and Glee, and the one I love, The Book of Dude. He's also been a frequent guest on Sirius XM Radio's Laughs USA. He's released comedy albums like The Feel Good Funny Guy, and he's got a dry bar comedy special called Boomers and Hipsters. Here is the real good funny guy himself, Nick Arnett. Please welcome him. Everybody, boom, boom. How's everybody doing? Record. I'm 66 years old, everybody. Boom. How about that? And I guarantee there's not one person in this room who has ever heard of me. Am I right? Boom. boom. Somebody gives me this book for my birthday. It's never too late. You're never too old. 50 people who found success after 50. That's 50 people out of 8 billion people in the world who found success after 50. And tonight, I might be one of them, everybody. <laughs> Boom! That's how we do it. You guys are awesome. Man, I, I'm going to give you a little tip right now. Inflation is ugly, right? I, I want to save you some money on gas. I live in LA, five bucks a gallon, over five bucks for gas, OK? Here's the deal, next time you're driving, you get out there, you put your car in neutral and let the earth rotate, okay? Yeah. Now here's another tip. I wanted to get my windows tinted, very expensive. Very, you know what I did instead? I bought a box of fruit roll-ups. <laughs> little snack and a little shade, both. You guys are, I really like you, you guys are so awesome. You really are. Now. This is such a treat, because I, I did a show in, in Beverly Hills last week, okay? And it is so tough doing comedy there, because the audience is all Botoxed up. <laughs> there was that couple in the front row. They had so much plastic surgery, their faces were being held back by a chip clip. <laughs> Boom, everybody! Everybody gets worried when I do my kicks, you know? Boom, they're so worried. Don't worry, I've got Medicare, everybody. Come on, man. It's all good. It's all good. How many baby boomers do we have in the room? You are my people, and you out there in TV land. Boomers, boom, we rock. You know, we're, we are the coolest people everywhere. You know why we're so cool? It's because we're in our second round of bell bottoms, everybody. That's right. Boom! Everything. Now, if you're not a boomer, you're a hipster, okay? Whether you're in here or out there in TV land. And you're, I'm gonna give you your props right now, okay? I'm gonna, if you're younger than a boomer, I'll just call you hipster, okay? And, and I'll, I'll give you your props right now. You're better looking. Every generation gets better looking than the one before. And if you don't believe me, 
Find a picture of your great, great granddad. <laughs> all, all right? But man, we are way cooler, man. We, every, everything they think is cool. We did it first. We had long hair first, short hair first, no hair first, right? The brightly colored hair, we had that too. We call them clowns, right? <laughs> what's, what's the other things these kids have? That, 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 the pants that sag way down here? We had them too. We call them diapers. <laughs> Boom, everybody! <laughs> How about the piercing? Do you see the kids with all these things? We had them too. We call them metal shop accidents. <laughs> oh, man. And, you know, kids have some, like, some of this generation has brought in good stuff, like texting, I think is awesome. I, I like Zoom, FaceTime, all cool, but not as cool. You know what we had? Party lines, everybody. Yeah, see? Am I right? And kids, they don't have good role models. They don't have good role models. They do, like, they've got this guy, Little Wayne. Poquito Wainito. You know who we had? John Wayne. Yeah. Boom, everybody! There's some young people in the front row still don't think we're cool. You know how cool we are? We got to ride in the front seat of the car when we were kids. No seatbelt either. That's right. And you know, didn't need a seatbelt. We just had mom's arm. Am I right? That's it. Still don't think we're cool. You know how cool we are? We went to the first Rolling Stones farewell tour. That's right. Man, you guys are so awesome. I come from a big family that's so, I have four sisters, no brothers, two older, two younger. And it, it never failed. If any of them cried, we were all in the same room, my dad would run in, she's crying, are you happy? Well, compared to her, I guess so. <laughs> Man. I remember when I was a kid, we, we had a uh, shag carpet, shag carpet people out there in TV land. The uglier, the better, the shag carpet. Remember the, oh man, so ugly, the shag. Anyway, we, we had the gold, brown, and, and, and the orange conglomerate, you know, the fall colors. If you had that, it meant at some point in time you were training a puppy, right? <laughs> if you had a stain, you just shook it, it dropped down 10 feet in the spring corn grew. <laughs> Remember you used to have to rake the shag? You had to rake it so it would all be standing up. Oh my gosh, it was such a hassle because you, you had to step on the furniture to get out of there. So you step on the coffee table, the sofa, the love seat, and accidentally you kicked over the fake plastic grapes. And they made the coolest toy of all time out of the same material. Who knows what these are? <laughs> Click clacks, that's right. Look how cool these are. What do things cost? Like uh, 50 cents back in the day, Xbox. Here we go, run out of time. Here we go, watch. What? Oh my gosh, I have more. To, I, I'm out of time, I'll have to tell you another time. So much fun, so much fun. Yay, boom everybody. Boom, you're awesome. Nick, it is great having you here. Love the stuff you brought me down memory lane. The one thing I can't do is I can go right there. Boom. Let's do a boom together. What do you say, everybody? <laughs> boom. boom. That's how. <laughs> that's oh, that was great. Hey, if you'd like to see more of Nick Arnett, if you'd like to book him for your venue or corporate event, our links to his books and dry bar comedy specials called Boomers and Hipsters, just go to Huckabee.tv. We will connect you. Hey, Mike Huckabee here. Listen, if you love your mom, apple pie, and being conservative, you know you ought to subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell and click the like button and show all the leftists out there that conservatives are thriving and patriotism is far from dead. Am I pandering too much? No way. I'm just getting started.